So the inhabitants of the, the gastrointestinal tract are huge, they're health promoting attributes, they're considered to be probiotic. So they're found in the gastrointestinal tracts of mammals. Bifidobacterium dentium is characterized as an oral pathogen. So they're found in the gut of bees and also in the chicken gastrointestinal tract. So our interest in the APC is regarding bifidobacteria. We all want to understand what, how do they establish at such high numbers in the gastrointestinal tract of victims? And also, when they're there, when they reach such high numbers, what benefits are they imparting on the host through being there? So that's really what we're exploring, and I'll give you a flavor of some of that work today. So the microbiome, the intestinal microbiome of breastfed infants can be up to 85% bifidobacteria. So the, we see here that bifidobacterium lama dominates with B. bifidum, B. brevin, and passionolatum also highly represented. When we look at human milk animal factor, there is a fraction of human milk that offers no nutrition to the infant, but survives transit through the gastrointestinal tract. There, it is a food source for bifidobacteria that are selectively able to metabolize these sugars and establish the high levels in the gastrointestinal tract. So when we look at these HMOs, what we see is they contain five monosaccharide components with various linkages, various lengths. These five monosaccharides are fucose, galactose, glucose, cyanic acid, and inocentic glucosamine. And much work has been done to determine the oligosaccharide composition of human milk and also of mother's milk from various mammals. And the various combinations, there are many, many, and for human milk, there have been over 200 structures identified. So when we look at HMO utilization by bifidobacteria in the gut, we find that strains of bifidobacteria bifidum and bifidobacteria monum subspecies infectus can directly use the human milk oligosaccharide structures. While strains of Bifidobacterium brevae and Bifidobacterium lamum subspecies lamum don't tend to use these directly, yet these Bifidobacterium species are present at relatively high numbers in the intestine of infants. So we deduce that these bacteria that don't use the HMO structure directly must be able to crossfeed in the intestine. So when we look at just the strains that can use the HMOs directly, we see that there are two ways in which they use them. Bifidobacterium lamum subspecies infectus uses what we call an intracellular HMO metabolism, in that it internalizes the HMOs and then intracellular glycosylhydrolases hydrolyze the carbohydrates into their monosaccharide components. Whereas Bifidobacterium bifidum produces extracellular enzymes that tend to cave off the fucose or the cyanic acid residues, then the lactose is internalized, and the fucose and the cyanic acid are not used by Bifidobacterium bifidum. So we wanted to explore the possibility of um, cross-feeding in the intestine by Bifidobacteria. Could we demonstrate in vivo that an extracellular glycosylhydrolase produced by Bifidobacterium could provide glucose and cyanic acid or indeed lactose to the extracellular environment that could be a source of carbohydrate to allow Bifidobacterium brevity to establish? So our model strain that we use for a lot of our work in Cork is Bifidobacterium brevity we sequence that a number of years ago with some images here as well. And that's been our prototype strain to really understand how bifidobacteria metabolize carbohydrates and how they, how they establish in the gut and how they bring benefits to the host. We studied this quite extensively. You can see here some of the carbohydrate utilization clusters that it, it, it um, has. We look at it in vivo response in relation to iron. We looked at its ability to produce pili. It produces an exopolysaccharide, and in this strain in particular, it actually produces two exopolysaccharides and has a, a divergent promoter that can flip between the two 
how it separates to produce different structures under different conditions. We've also, sorry, I'm uh, if, as we move along here, we see we study quite extensively the restriction modification systems that are produced by bacterial bacteria, because these are uh, means that stop incoming DNA actually coming into the bacteria cells. It's been critical to be able to overcome these RA systems to be able to genetically modify these individual bacteria. And each strain has a different set of restriction modification systems. So BRB UC C2003 has been our model strain, and uh, we also, with the amount of strains that we've been able to be taking in the is actually quite small because of the restriction modification systems and the variety of these are in the strains and having to overcome these. One strain we have worked with in the lab is BRB JCM7017, and quite that's a big because it has contributed megaplasm in that strain. And that strain, that class of harbor such traits that may be health promotion. And that in my conjugation is non-GM, so it's already interesting to be able to transfer that megaplasma into commercial strains. We also work quite a lot of the strain that uses a high level of conjugated linoleic acid, and that has health promotion attributes as well. And being able to work and work out the health attributes of various strains has drawn quite some interest from various companies. And we work with elementary health. And Procter and Gamble on the uh, 35624, we got on the strain that's incorporated into the aline probiotic. It escapes and it's marketed, marketed under Alflorex in Ireland and in the UK. And this strain um, contributes to alleviating um, intestinal discomfort. And it's been quite a successful product, and it's elementary health is a spin out from the UCC. We've also worked um, extensively with the genome on the strain that's incorporated. One of the BMR subspecies axis is one of our five strain cocktails that's in their genome um, activity yogurt products. And we work quite a lot with them to work out how this strain functions uh, and is health promoting. More recently, we've been working with Nutritia. Nutritia and genome are um, essentially the same company. Nutrition is based in the Netherlands and they're getting infant food formulations. And they, you're probably familiar with Aptalum, um, they make that formulation and they want to understand how strains metabolize carbohydrates that are in the infant food formulations, how to make better infant food formulations, and how the uh, infant bacteria and various strains that they have in their collection might be incorporated into various infant food formulations. And more recently, we're working with 4D Pharma for their bifidobacterium bacteria strain. So making mutations in bifidobacteria is very uh, difficult. Uh, we made first insertion methods around 10 years ago, and we managed to do that quite routinely. But for making deletions in bifidobacteria, that can work when you want to knock out a small gene, or when you want to knock out multiple genes on the genome to associate a particular phenotype in the gene cluster. So we received these plasmas, two plasmas from um, a Japanese group. So when we wanted to investigate, to see if we could get these, this system working in our strain, we decided that we'd actually tackle two genes that were part of the cyanic acid metabolism cluster of the relic. So a PhD student in our lab, Murray Egan, and a special paper down here, had worked extensively on the ability on the cyanic acid metabolism pathway of the bifidobacterium bacterium And what she had seen from her analysis that when she made mutations in each of the genes, in IA, NAN K, NAN B, NAN C, she, her mutant strains lost the ability to be able to metabolize cyanic acid. When she made a mutation in the NAN A gene, one of two copies of the NAN A gene, she didn't see the phenotype. So the, she kind of predicted that the other gene and its functionality was compensated. So that's why we weren't seeing the phenotype. So what I asked to do was to make individual deletion mutants of the two NAG genes and also make a double mutant. So when we analyzed those two mutant strains that compared to the wildtype, what we saw was that each of the strains had comparable growth as the wildtype when grown on lactose. Each of the single mutant strains could grow on sciatic acid, 
the song thanks and the NSF is Nikolsky, Ellen Kier, and Aginti. But my total new constraint here is in case we build a group of these four carbohydrates. So in this case, I have proved that the system worked, which is what we want to know. You should just the system has worked. And we have shown that, yes, these two copies of the NAG-AG, we demonstrated, did we show that they were essential for the cyanic acid metabolism, and they were likely compensation for each other. We thought, well, could we do an experiment in people? Could we show now that we had some we had a strain that wasn't able to grow on these carbohydrates that were quite dominant in uh, more than this milk? So we went to say, could we do a mouse experiment? Now, finding the oligosaccharide composition of urine milk was quite hard. So when I did eventually find the paper for Pietro et al. 1995, there's been a lot of analysis done on milk of various mammals, but not of mice, because the second quantity in milk is the issue. But we did see that in addition to lactose, we had three FL, two FL, and the cyanobacteroses. So our experiment was set up. What we wanted to do, we wanted to look at mother to pup transmission of the Bifidobacterium strains that we were looking at here. We wanted to basically do a crossbreeding experiment. We have our B bifidum and our B brevi. So we took pregnant germ free B fifty-seven mice. Each group had seven mice. To group one, we gave the wild type strain B bifidum and B brevi. And to our second group, we gave the B bifidum again and our double lesion strain. The three litters and eighteen pups were produced by our, our first group, and six litters and thirty-two pups were produced by our second group of mothers. All the pups were born within five days, and what we wanted to look at was look at the, the pups when they were being damped, when they were being reared by their mothers. So we had to use the first 15, win 15 days of life as our window, because once the pups' eyes opened, they would start eating the chow. So we monitored each of the strains in the mother species, and what we saw is that our bee brevi component, it colonized to almost a two long higher level than our B bifidum strain. And why that is, is because the B brevi can metabolize starch, which is a major component of the, the mouse child, whereas the bifidobacterium bifidum doesn't metabolize starch. Again, we show here the mothers and the pups. So from, we called on two days over during that 15 day window while the mouse is being reared by their mothers. And we took 14 animals on the first day and 16 animals on the second. And I'll just show you the data from one of the days because it's the same for the data. What we see is that the B brevet component, as compared to the bifidum component, in the cecum or the large intestine of the mice that contain the wild type strain, the B brevet was, was around two logs higher here. Whereas the B brevet strain, that was our double deletion strain, as compared to the B bifidum, was at a similar level, both in the cecum and also in the large intestine. So what that demonstration is to us is that the ability to cross-feed use the cyanic acid that the cucose that was produced by the B bifidum and was giving our wild type strain a selective advantage in the intestine of the dam vertical. We went on to look at the gene expression of our wild type strain and our mutant strain in vivo, and what we could see that the genes for lactose metabolism, body flux, glucose metabolism, and cyanic acid metabolism were upregulated in vivo or wild type strain, and only lactose and body genes were upregulated in the um, in our mutant strain. We didn't see upregulation of the genes associated with glucose metabolism. So in summary for this part, we've shown that we were able to use our new molecular tools to create both different deletions, single and double deletions. We had shown mother to transmission of the bifidobacteria, and we could show that we have the cross-feeding capability of bifidobacterium brevi allowed be ready to establish in the neonatal gut. So so we're also very interested in fits and adhesive, adhesive. And what's produced by, on the surface of bifidobacteria in the gut that might be interacting with the host. 
So I show various structures here. I talk a little bit about tag the line. EPS, uh, store test PLI as well. We sell very sellable coaching uh, AI too as well. So here again, I show the EPS cluster of bacteria and virus. And we've shown um, previously that the EPS allows bifidobacteria, this coaching, sugar coaching that's on bifidobacteria, it allows the bifidobacteria to obey the host immune system. So the surface proteins are not seen by the host immune system. And we've more recently shown that this EPS, it shelters the bacteria and allows systemic spread as well beyond the gut. So here I show um, the wild type of ECC 2003. You can see it's sugar coating here. And here we have EPS negative derivative of ECC 2003. And you see it lacks the sugar coating here. And these images were captured by uh, Bing and no questions out here in part of the AGRC. We also have been interested in sorting film. And this stream can, doesn't produce sorting dependent film because of a poly G sequence that leads to a frame shift actually in the first stream of the cluster. What I did here was I reconstructed these film genes so the poly G was, was back in frame. So I had to reduce or increase the poly G to make it in frame to see if these pillai were produced. And we see here for the strains that are constructed that the pillai are produced, just those two images there. And uh, very talented postdoc in our lab, uh, this Dr. has been able to demonstrate that this slippage, slippage back to in frame, can occur in vivo. And we're also looking at the host response to that. So when we sequence the, this genome of our bacterium, our prototype bacterium, we used to see 2003, we initially observed that it had this gene cluster that we knew wasn't expressed under in vitro conditions. And we, when we analyzed it, we saw that all the genes were present for the assembly, pillars, proteins, regulation, and processing of head pillar. So, how all these come together to form the pin line? I'm just a bit here. The tag Z we start down here shows homology to a septum cytotermine protein in the AMD. And what this does is it brings the pillars proteins to the cell hole for the pin line form. Tag A is an ADPase, so that energizes the process. Tag B and tag C are the permeases. FLP, tag E, and tag F, they're encoded on a separate upper arm here. They're the actual pillar proteins that form the pillar structure. Now they are encoded as prepillins and they're processed by the prepillin peptidase tag B before being assembled into the pillar structure here. FLP forms the pillar's backbone and tag E and tag F decorate the pillar structure. So we knew that this cluster was not expressed under in vitro, or in vitro conditions. But we wondered, was it expressed under in vivo conditions? Would it have an effect on colonization? So I made the mutation in the tag A gene and introduced the wild type strain of the tag A mutant into uh, germ-free mice. So we administered the bacterial strain over five days, given one by 10 to the 9 bacteria per day, of either the wild type or the mutant strain. Now we initially planned to do this experiment in just 30 days. But as the experiment was progressing, what we saw in the germ three months, or the monoassociated mice rather, is that they were each colonizing to a very similar level. So as the effect approach, we decided that we take half the animals from each group. We take animals in each group, half the animals from each group were removed put into the conventional rooms, and we can pick up pellets from conventional mice into the cages. What we observed then, when we continue to monitor the bacteria shedding of the feces, was the number of the one type strain dropped to around 10 to the 6, which is the level of colonization we get in the Joe's firm in conventional mice. But then our 10 day mutant strain was completely lost. And what this demonstrated to us is the importance of these pillars for the colonization of bifidobacteria when they're in the presence 
of a conventional one by Russia. We went on and we retained sacrum and intestinal copper from these mice, and we performed KF67 immunohistochemistry chemistry to look for proliferation in the intestine. What we observed is that mice that were model associated with white type strain, we see proliferation of KF67 staining here in the intestine. This resembles the intestine of our conventional animals where we see similar staining. Why the tissue from our mice that were administered are heavy and strain that didn't produce the pili left this proliferation and remain more similar to that of our germ free controls. And you see graphical representation there of that as well. We went on to recover the residual bacteria from the intestine of the mice. And we were able to perform immunoglobulin to microscopy, and we can visualize the pili at the cell bones of the digital bacteria from the vivo samples. So there are a couple of papers and there's a two patterns from this work. And we also see actually on this image you can see the EPS that surrounds the digital bacteria in strain. So there was also, we, we, kind of, we knew that it was probably the pili that were eliciting this proliferation. But really, is it possible that there's something else that the digital bacteria were produced? So to answer that question, we expressed the full telescope clustering Lactococcus lactus. Here you see the Lactococcus and the Coccus cells. And here you see the pili that are being produced by the Lactococcus lactus. We incorporated those in in vitro proliferation assays and in each case you see that our type 2000 archivists producing strain of lactococcus leads to increased proliferation of our epithelium cells by this proliferation assay. We want to work out which of the pillars proteins. You remember the effect on the type B and type F there was a separating proteins from the pillar. So we want to work out which specific protein is responsible for the proliferation response. So we were able to adopt our technologies that I described earlier and make integrated deletions in these very small genes, type E and type N. So we examined the strain again, they monosociated to an equal level. But when we looked at the, the KR67 proliferation, we saw that our strain, you see 2003, the left type E, didn't give us the proliferation response. So this is the case of type E in the proliferation that we were seeing. We've gone on and we've been able to purify tagging and also show uh, to show <coughs> that the DNA is actually effective. We can express it in that to compass so that it's secreted and we can show in your run models that it is also effective in the proliferation. I'll just show you some an experiment that um, we did in collaboration with Emory University and Antonisha Lab, where we did um, we made bones in the intestine of animals using endoscopy. And by administering the white type strain, our pillus negative strain, or our TED E negative strain, we were able to observe that in each, every experiment we did, we always got enhanced healing with our white type strain as compared to our pillus negative strain or our strain that didn't produce TED E, indicating that the pillai contribute to the enhanced wound healing observed with this digital bacteria. So, just to wrap up, I hope that I demonstrated to you how visual bacteria establish in the gut and also giving you an example of the molecules that they produce that allow interaction with the host. So, the ability to grow in the gut uh, by being able to metabolize various carbohydrates, including HMOs, leads to pillus expression and contributes to the maturation of the intestine. This obviously has some application and may have application maybe for premature infants to help with the establishment of the intestine and in these symptoms. So finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention and also thank the people that work with me. Um, Amy Houston does all of my immunohistochemistry chemistry in a blinded manner in Cork. So it's all uh, very thoroughly done. Professor Kurt Shannon, our director, and I've worked with Dale Van Sintry for many years. The animal studies team in Cork, they're magnificent, both in the preclinical facility and also our very small germ free facility. And also to thank our collaborators, no pressure then, in here in Galway and the AGRC. I've worked with uh, William Tomas and Justice Raymond in Helsinki for a lot of the immune war genetic microscopy that I've done. I have some time to show you everything today. And also at Emory University in Atlanta, where I worked uh, with Ashtak Alam and in Professor Andrew Nisha's lab, where we did all the endoscopy work. So thank you very much.